Awesome. Well, I um, read a leadership article this week, and if you're like, I, I think most people, it's easy for emails to pile up in your inbox. So there's this leadership email I get probably once a week, maybe twice a week, and so the emails just come in and they start piling up, but there was this one particular email that the title caught my attention. And so even though I didn't get to it for two, three, maybe four weeks, it was that initial title that later led me to read the article. I knew, based on the title, that I would want to go back and read that article. And actually, the author, um, this particular uh, leadership blogger, he was speaking my language because he was saying how to have a great 2018. But that really wasn't the word that caught my attention. The word that caught my attention was the word grit. Say the word grit. 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 It's just like, it's a good word. It's a wholesome word. It's a, you know, it's it's a gritty word, right? You you, You feel it when you say it. And so it was grit over genius, how to make 2018 great. So it was that word grit that really caught my attention. So this week I read the article and he shared some good thoughts and it kind of served as this inspiration for today. And so I've titled today's message, uh, Grit, and how to, you know, how little things add up to make a big difference in our lives. Grit in this context is defined as courage. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's moxie, it's courage, it's resolve, it involves strength of character. Make no mistake about it, if you want 2018 to be great, to be good, it's going to require some grit. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? It's going to require some grit from you and I. It's going to require some 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 strength of character, some courage, some resolve, some moxie in this next year. So at the end of 2018, I I think it would be amazing if all of us were able to look back at 2018 at the end and see that the difference in 2018, that the difference was for you and I, was that word grit. A little grit can make a big difference. So the first grit that I want to talk about this morning is is the idea of motivational grit, the importance of motivational grit. So as we look at 2018, right, we're staring it down. We're on the cusp. There it is. And so as we head into 2018, I think you and I, we're going to need some motivational grit. Now, if you have your Bibles, open your Bible up to John chapter 12. Actually, John chapter 15, you'll see it on the screen there. And I'm going to read the first uh, 12 verses. So if you'd Uh, read along with me that would be awesome in your bible not mine be a little bit harder to read along with me right from my bible unless you want to join me up here so john chapter 15 starting verse 1 lots of letters in red if you have a bible in which jesus's words are written in red you'll notice just paragraph after paragraph after paragraph word after word of letters in red. So starting there in verse 15, this is Jesus speaking. He said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Now, there's one thing I want you to do with me as I read. I want you to unaligned in your Bible every time that you, you see the words abide. Okay, so we're going to get to that here in just a minute. So every time you see the words abide or remain or stay, I want you to to underline those words. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word of God, which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you, say it with me, abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. Notice what Jesus says marks discipleship, spiritual formation. It's fruit. 
Paul says in Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. So you think about those things that come forth from our lives. Those things are produced as you and I abide as we remain in Him. He says, by this my Father is glorified. So when you and I produce fruit, guess what? The Father is glorified by that. When you and I produce fruit in our lives. As the Father loved me, I also love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, I hope we, we caught the significance of the word abide. It was mentioned seven times in those 12 verses. So how many know anytime you reemphasize a word, you say a word over and over again, it's usually because you want to emphasize that word, because it's important, because it's something, an idea, a concept, right? You're trying to get across. If you're with your kids or if you're a, a boss and you're working with your employees, anytime you go back and you go over and over and over something, you do that for the fact that you want it to get in them, Right? It's important. You need to know this. And so Jesus says, abide, abide, abide. Seven times you'll find it written there because it's speaking of, of something that's, that's very important to, to our relationship with Christ, the importance of abiding. The word means to remain or to stay. So the whole idea there is stay in a relational place of proximity. Stay close, stay near. You'll find the same word, used in Matthew 10 verse 11 and here's that verse it says in whatever city or village you enter inquire who is worthy in it Jesus was telling his disciples and stay at that house until you leave that city that word stay is the same word that's abide here that we just read Matthew 11 23 and you Capernaum will not be exalted to heaven will you you will descend to Hades For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. And so that's the idea of the word abide. It's this idea of remaining. It's this idea of of staying. It it speaks of relational proximity, being close, being near, staying connected. So the image of the vine and the branch reminds us of the importance of not casual, once in a while connection. When I feel like a connection, it speaks of this continual connection connection of abiding remaining staying close staying near the abiding relationship that jesus talks about is one in which the branch continually draws its life from the vine and who did jesus say is the branch who are the branches we are the branches and so you and i we we draw life as we abide as we remain in the branch as we remain in relationship Uh, in verse one jesus said i am the vine now these words remind me what jesus said in john chapter six jesus said in a very similar sense he said i am the bread of life what is he saying it's just another way of saying that you and i as we remain in him that we draw life from him that he is the source of our spiritual life he is the source of that life He is the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Same idea. Jesus is the source, again, of our life. True life is found in him as we remain in this mutual relationship. And as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, notice notice the, 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 the value or the consequences of remaining. He says, as you remain, you'll be fruitful. Right? If you and I want to be fruitful, we have to stay connected. We have to remain in a place of relationship with him. You find that in verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 8. So fruitfulness is connected to this, this place of vitality, this place of life, of being connected to the vine, drawn from the vine. Did you catch what verse 3 said? Verse 3 says, said there that we are cleansed as we remain in the vine. Sounds like something that Paul used in Ephesians 5, verse 26, and talking about how the the water washes, cleanses the mind with the washing of the water of the word. Verse 7 says, 
His words abide in us. So as we abide in him, what happens is his words come alive in us through relationship, through that connection. Another consequence of abiding in him, his words come alive in him. Right? We want to have the words of Jesus in us. We want it to come out in our character and our actions and, and how we live and how we interact with others. If they're not there, we can't access them. Right? If they're not in us, they can't come out of us because what's going to come out of us is what's in us. So if they're in us, if they abide in us, then they're going to come out in our attitude and in our actions. It'll be something that we're growing in. And here's the, the reality of this. As we become fruitful, as we have our minds <clears throat> excuse me, cleansed, and as his word, words abide in us, we become transformed people. We're, we're transformed from the inside out. And, and we become people who reflect the mind, the heart, and, and the, the will and the intention of God. Right? It's through abiding in a place of relationship that we begin to take on his mind. And his heart becomes more of our hearts. And where our desires become more of his desires. And have you know that as his desires become our desires and our mind becomes his mind, as our prayers become his prayers, what did it say there as a result? That whatever we desire will become ours. When does that happen? That happens when we're in a place of relationship with him that we're becoming more and more like him and our hearts are being transformed and we're going to want the things that he wants. And when we want the things that he wants, guess what? They're more likely to become a reality in our hearts and our lives. Right? The will of God will be played out in our hearts and our lives and in our minds. So remember, it was Jesus who said, I can only do and say what I see my Father doing and saying. And so it's through this abiding relationship of remaining in, in, in relationship with Christ, staying close to him, that our, our wills are shaped, our minds are shaped. And it's in that place that we learn to say and to do only what we see our Father saying and doing. So through relationship, as we remain connected to the vine, Jesus said, abide in me. What does that speak of? It speaks of being captivated by his life and his love. And this echoes the words of the beloved in, in uh, Song of Solomon 6.3, when uh, the, the writer there, and, and he wrote and he said, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Right? Chapter 15 echoes those, those words where um, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And so think about this. This is the, the challenge, isn't it, for us as people, as humans. It's a challenge of abiding, of remaining in relationship in the midst of a busy schedule. Where unless we create space and we create time, it's going to be the thing that always eludes us. It's going to be the thing that we never have enough of. Right? We have to be intentional to create that space and opportunity in our minds, in our hearts, and our lives to be able to be with him in relationship, to stay close. Think about the challenge of abiding in the midst of a kingdom that is fighting to captivate our hearts and our minds. From video games and entertainment to the things we see around us, keeping up with the Joneses. I mean, all of those things are after our hearts. They want to captivate our minds and our imaginations. That's, that's what we think about. That's what we desire. That's where our minds go. So it's a challenge in the midst of that, in this kingdom, to be able to have a kingdom of God mindset where our minds are, you know, connecting with him, where we're abiding, where we're not distracted, where we're caught up in, in what he says, caught up in what he wants and what he wills. Come on, have you know, that's a challenge. It's a challenge to stay in that place. It becomes a difficult to abide when our hearts are captivated by other people, things, and opportunities. Abiding is challenging in the sense that it speaks to me of my first and my best. And it's always a challenge to give Jesus my first and my best. The first of all of me, the best of all of me, the best of my, you know, and the first of my time and my money and all of those things, right? It's a challenge, but I, I, think, I think abiding speaks to those things. And this is where motivation and grit come in. Because I've had mountaintop experiences, and I, I love 
you know, I love, as I look back over the course of my life, some of the amazing, ex- I've had some amazing experiences with Jesus. And I hope that you have. But you know what? It takes grit to live between the mountaintop experiences. It takes grit when you don't feel like spending time with him. It takes grit when you don't feel like getting out of bed and coming to church, right? When there's a lot of other things you could be doing with your time and your devotion. It takes this grit to be determined in your heart. No, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be disciplined in this area of my life. I'm going to carve out space and time. I'm going to put Jesus first. I'm going to be disciplined in these different areas of my life. You don't do it unless you have grit. It's easy to follow Jesus when things are going great. And I feel the natural, relational, right, connection, attraction. It's kind of like when you're first married, right? Things, you know, there's just a lot of that natural, you know, attraction thing going on. And then the longer that you're married, you've got to continue to work at that, to cultivate that, to keep that alive in your relationship, to keep the romance alive. Because it once maybe was easy, if it's not easy anymore, you have to work at it, right? It's this, it's this relationship thing that, that we have to have grit toward. It's so important to realize that. So think about that. Maybe you've had some incredible moments and some times in your life where you're just naturally motivated. But what about when you're not? What's going to get through you those times? What's going to keep you pursuing God, putting him first, making those, those decisions? I would propose to you that it's grit. So where are the faithful? Where are the the abiders who, through grit, continue to put Jesus first before jobs, before things, before people? Where are the God seekers? You want to make 2018 great? Put Jesus first. Seek him. So I want to ask you a great question. How is your motivational grit? So if 2018 is going to be great, we're going to have to have some motivational grit. Secondly, we're going to have to have some relational grit. Even our best relationships require grit. We have to keep working at them. 2018 will be no different. At the end of it, you and I will look back and a lot of the success of the year will look and and depend on how things went relationally. Right? God designed us that way. We're just wired that way where relationships are important to our well-being, to the sense of who we are as people. So if you have a key relationship that's taken a hit over the past year or maybe years, can I encourage you here, do whatever it takes to make it right. Do whatever it takes to see that relationship restored. You know, if you think and if you line up in your mind... Think about all the greatest assets that you have. Think about the things that you treasure most in your life. If not near the top, it should be really close. It should be relationships. It should be at the top. The relationships that we enjoy with, with one another and with others, it should be near the top, at the top of the list. You think about the two greatest commandments. Jesus said, love me and love others. Love me, love others. Loving God's number one, loving others is number two. So to me, this speaks of the importance of how those two are interconnected. You cannot separate loving God from loving others. Think about it. They affect each other they impact each other loving God with everything impacts how I see and interact with others and loving others impacts how I see and interact with God the two they cannot be separated the kingdom of God is set up in such a way that the that both of these commandments are interconnected and if you think of uh, the, the greatest themes the great themes of the Bible of scripture restoration is one of the great themes And so, again, if you have a relationship that's taken a hit in the past year, do what it takes to see that restored. That article that I mentioned at the very beginning was written by a leadership pastor guy by the name of Dan Reland. And Dan said this. He said, on a practical level, it's on the screen, it's nearly impossible to function at your peak potential if you are distracted by broken, hurting, or dysfunctional relationships. 
I feel, know the weight of that, and I know that you do as well. And so if there's a relationship that's core, that's important to you, and it's taken a hit, would you work at it? Would you do your part? So here's what this may mean for you and I. This may mean forgiving and letting go of a deep wound so that healing can come to the relationship. And sometimes that's hard, isn't it? To let go of something, to let go of a wound, to let go of something that someone said or that someone did. To forgive and to let go of that thing. That could be one of the most important, critical, significant things you do in the next year is to let go of that thing and to forgive and then to begin, begin pursuing that relationship. This may mean humbling yourself and taking ownership of your part. Right? It always takes two to tangle. And even if you feel like you're completely right, sometimes it's the the it's sometimes it's it's one person being the bigger person and saying, you know what? I was wrong to begin the restoration process. So I'm going to ask you to be the bigger person in 2018. This may mean taking the first step and swallowing our pride in the process. Again, even if you feel like you're always the first to do so, do it again. Do it one more time. And it may mean being wrong. Again, for core relationships, listen, this is how I feel, and I'm not saying that I'm always great at it or any of that. I'm not putting myself up there as the, the pinnacle of this, but I, I am saying this. For core relationships, I would rather be wrong and have the relationship than be right and not have the relationship. So think about those core relationships, those most important relationships in your life, right? Do you have to be right to the point of not having the relationship, or are you willing to let go of that so that you can maintain the relationship? Now, obviously, I'm, I'm talking about semi-healthy, you know, <laughs> relationships. I'm not talking about dysfunctional uh, relationships here where, you know, the codependence or, you know, any of those things that, you know, that happen in terms of that. I, I'm talking about core, healthy, good relationships, that there's mutual things that go on in the relationship. So make your core relationships right in 2018. Here's a little step that can pay big dividends in how 2018 plays out. So I just want to ask, in terms of grit surrounding this, do you have a core relationship that needs to be restored? And then number three, here's something else, a little that makes a big difference, and it involves visional grit. So we have motivational grit, we have relational grit, and then we have visional grit. I imagine in Luke chapter 19 that as Jesus looked over Jerusalem, it says that Jesus looked over Jerusalem, and it's there that Jesus wept. And he said these, these profound words. He said, oh, Jerusalem, if you had only known what made for peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Now just imagine those words being spoken by Jesus, and here's what I see. I see this, this tension, this conflict, right, between, again, what is and what will be. So what is, is that Jerusalem has missed this day of visitation, this opportunity to see God in the flesh, Jesus right in front of them. What does John 1 say? Jesus came to his own, and even his own did not recognize the day of the visitation. So Jesus says, I'm here, and you don't have eyes to see that I'm here. Because you've been expecting something different. You were expecting a military messiah. You were expecting a different package, and and yet here is God right in front of you. You cannot see it. So Jesus was in this place of what is and what he knows to be true down the line. See, I sometimes feel this on a smaller scale as I think about the people sometimes that, and, and we're all it at different times, but where we just don't seem to connect it. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? 
They're, they're in our church, they're in our communities, they're around us, they're in our families, they are us at different times where, where it's like, man, if you could only see what makes for peace in your life, if you could only see how your, you know, your, your, your situation could be transformed, if you could only learn, if we could only learn what it means to put Jesus first to begin ordering our lives around the gospel. See, I, I, I get that. Jesus is in that place, and it's only if you could see. So he, he feels the weight of that, but yet he knows that something's coming. He knew that you and I would be here today. Sitting where we're sitting, hearing what we're hearing, following him. See, he was stuck between what is and what would be. And if he was going to live out what would be, he would, it would require some visional grit. He was going to have to keep his eye on the prize, his eye on the goal. He's going to have to keep his, his eye on this, this idea that one day, thousands of people, millions of people would respond to the cross and what he did. Right? He had visional grit. It takes visional grit to not get bogged down and overwhelmed by what is. Visional grit says that whatever is, whatever is in your life, some of it you like, some of it you don't, but whatever it is, it doesn't have to always be that way. That's what visional grit says because we have an eye on what's down the road, what's coming. A vision, a dream, perspective, understanding. Right? I'm here. This is my life now and I may feel stuck, but I know what's coming down the road. I know there's a better today, tomorrow. I know that God's at work in my family, at work in my children, in my spouse, in my marriage, in my relationships. See, Visional Grit says, believe, hope, cling to the promises of God, for they are yes and amen to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so if you are holding on to a promise, this is what your life is right now. You may not like it, but you have some promises that God has given you. Here's what the Bible says. They are yes and amen to those who are in Christ Jesus. They are yours, but you're not seeing it. They're yours. You cling to it. You hope it. You hold on to it. You don't let go of it. That's what Visional Grit requires of you and I. To not give up. You may not be where you want to be. Don't let that get in the way of a better future. Maybe there's something in your past that you can't seem to shake. You keep looking in the rear view mirror and you're having a hard time looking forward. Maybe it's time that you begin to look forward more. And trust God to help you break free from that past so that you can go after what God has in front of you. Maybe for you, it's your children. Maybe it's for you, it's, it's a vision for your life. Maybe for you, it's someone you care about deeply and they may not be where you want them to be or where they want to be right now. What do you do? You hold on. You don't let go of God's promises, right? You, you keep believing, you keep clinging, you keep praying, you keep holding on to that. You don't let go of it. That's what relational or I mean, visional grit is. If you see something different, visional grit doesn't give up on what it sees. And that's, the, that's, the, that's really the, the kicker, isn't it? It's what do you see, right? If, if all you see is the moment, the present, if this is all you see is the mess and all you see is the hopelessness and all you see is the financial distress and all you see is all the drama in the family, if this is all you see, then it's going to be hard to see beyond that. What can you see beyond where you're at? See, that's what you and I need to, to do right before 2018 or early on, before it slips away, is really ask God to give us a vision for what's down the road. Just enough to keep us looking out above the stuff. Time and circumstances may challenge what you see. Grit doesn't give up on them. And it may be that some of you have given up Listen, it's time to re-engage. If I can have the, the worship team. If everybody come on up, the rest of the worship team. It, it's, it's time to re-engage. You know, I was thinking about, I, I've said it before, and um, I was thinking about the, the band Journey. 
Come on, it's so relevant here, right? Don't stop believing. Come on, who wants to sing it for me? I know you want to sing it. There we go. Come on. Didn't know you were going to encounter Journey in church this morning, did you? <clears throat> but don't stop believing. Keep your eye on the prize. Here's what Paul wrote in reference to Jesus. He said, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Who for the joy of this day, of you being where you are, Jesus endured the cross. See, he never lost sight of what would be, of what could come about, of one transformed heart, one transformed mind, one transformed family. And how that could alter the course of history and time and space and who for the joy set before him. He was able to keep his eye on the prize. Torture and rejection awaited him and he knew it. How do you walk into that? You walk into that when you know what lies beyond the torture and the rejection. It says that Jesus willingly laid down his life for that, for you and for me. So each of these little things, visional grit, relational grit, motivational grit, I think if you take those three things and you think about them, three little things that I think can have a profound impact on 2018. They all add up to make a difference toward a great 2018. So if you're someone that likes next steps and where you don't have to think about your next step too much, they're on the screen. Grace, if you want to put those up. There's four I thought of. You can think of your own, but practice more grid in 2018. Identify one key relationship that needs to be restored. Don't give up by keeping your eye on the prize. Maybe you need to be reminded of what is beyond. So trying to figure that out. God, I need some vision for my life, for my family, for where I'm at. And maybe for you, it's just creating space to see Jesus in 2018. I get excited about a new year. I think this is one of my favorite times because it's this reminder that things don't have to stay the way that they are. Right, but it's gonna require us some grit, some motivation, some discipline, right, to see those things realized. So we're gonna... We're